it might rain. It's my understanding that the fence is resting. Is that correct? correct? All right. I'm not going to bring the jury out just to take them back in. So when they, after we finish our motions and they come out, I'll let you say that. Yeah. Okay. Let's just do it that way. All right. So based on them resting, you have a motion. And I did receive your memo ahead of time, so I have reviewed that. Okay. I have that. Okay. Yes, sir. I think it's just going to be oral arguments. Yes, sir. Uh, good morning, Your Honor. May it please the court. Ben Chu for plaintiff Johnny Depp. Uh, Mr. Depp hereby moves to strike defendant Amber Heard's counterclaims because Ms. Heard has not proven by clear and convincing evidence that Mr. Waldman made the three allegedly defamatory statements with actual malice. Right, but clear and convincing is not my motion to strike standard. Un understood, Your Honor. Okay. And we, we have cited the, the okay. standard in our brief. Thank you. Uh, moreover, Your Honor, the court should also strike defendant's claim for immunity and attorney's phase uh, based on Virginia's anti-slap statute as she is not entitled to immunity under the statute. Because we know that the court has carefully reviewed our motion papers, I will just hit some of the salient points. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. I would mention, however, uh, Your Honor, that uh, because this is not included in our brief, that there is no record evidence whatsoever that Mr. Depp even saw any of the three statements that Mr. Waldman made prior to being served with the counterclaims in this action, which we believe is relevant to many of the legal standards. And as Your Honor is aware, Ms. Hurd had signaled for the past week that she was planning to call Mr. Depp in her case in chief, and it was our anticipation that she would try to fill what we believe is a gaping hole in with respect to the elements of her proof. Again, there's no record evidence whatsoever that Mr. Depp ever saw any of the three statements about which Ms. Heard is purportedly suing him for $100 million. As Your Honor is aware, the elements of defamation are as follows. One, publica publication of two, an actionable statement with three, the requisite intent. See Thorpe, Tharp versus Sanders, 280, 285 Virginia 476 at 2013. The requisite intent for defamation against a public figure is actual malice. That is, the statement must be made with knowledge that it was false or with reckless disregard of whether it was false or not. C. Sanders v. Harris, 213 Virginia, 369 at 372, a 1972 case. See also Jackson v. Hartig, 274 Virginia at 2019. Reckless disregard, as Your Honor is aware, quote, is not measured by whether a reasonably prudent person would have published or would have investigated before publishing ellipses. There must be sufficient evidence to permit the conclusion that the defendant, in fact, entertained serious doubts as to the truth of, the, of his publication, unquote. St. Amant versus Thompson, 390 U.S. Supreme Court, 727 at 731. Your Honor, the evidence shows that Ms. Heard cannot prevail on her claim because she cannot and did not establish that Mr. Waldman made the statements with actual malice. Mr. Waldman testified that he conducted extensive investigation and reasonably, reasonably believed that the, the three statements he made were true. Ms. Heard presented nothing, nothing, to contradict that undisputed fact. Ms. Heard has no evidence of direct liability because obviously, Your Honor, we need to talk about direct and vicarious liability, but it, it bears noting that she has no evidence of direct liability and cannot prove actual malice by Mr. Waldman when making the three statements at issue. It is undisputed 
that Mr. Depp did not make any of the three statements at issue in Ms. Hurd's counterclaim. Moreover, uh, in order for Mr. Depp to be liable for the conduct of his, one of his attorneys, there must be some showing that he directed, participated, or otherwise authorized Mr. Waldman to make the statements at issue. There is no such evidence on the record that Mr. Depp directed or otherwise authorized Mr. Waldman to make the three allegedly defamatory statements at issue in the counterclaims. Indeed, there is no evidence of any communication or coordination between Mr. Depp and Mr. Waldman regarding the counterclaim statements or anything else. For this reason as well, Your Honor, Ms. Hurd cannot meet her burden of proving that Mr. Waldman was acting within the scope of his employment as our, our agency uh, on behalf of Mr. Depp. Again, it bears noting that there's no evidence that Mr. Depp even saw the statements by Mr. Waldman until he was sued, served with the counterclaims well into this case. It was more than a year after Mr. Depp filed his, his complaint and Ms. Hurd lost a series of motions to dismiss that she finally uh, asserted her counterclaims, most of which have already been dismissed by opinion letter of this court. Whereas here there is no evidence of direct liability, Ms. Hurd must rely on a theory of vicarious liability to hold Mr. Depp liable for the actions or statements, rather, of his purported agent, Mr. Waldman. Vicarious liability is by definition, quote, liability for the tort of another person, unquote. So to hold Mr. Depp liable for Mr. Waldman's statements, Ms. Hurd must establish that Mr. Waldman himself committed all the elements of defamation. I know the court's familiar with this, so I'll try to run through it quickly. C. Parker versus Car Carillon Clinic, 296 Virginia 319 at 332, a 2018 case. Quote, vicarious liability is liability for the tort of another person. It necessarily follows that a claimant cannot make out a case for vicarious liability against an employer without first proving that the employee committed a tort within the scope of his employment. See also Routon Pontiac Corp versus Alston, 236 Virginia, 152 at page 156. Which standard Ms. Hurd has not met? And Your Honor, we cite a string cite, citation to cases from other jurisdictions, which we obviously are not binding on the court, but we believe are influential. We presented those to the court um, for its review. It is Ms. Hurd's burden to prove by clear and convincing evidence, or, or ultimately, uh, to prove actual malice by Mr. Waldman, not Mr. Depp. And while it is well settled law in Virginia, as Your Honor has pointed out, pointed out last week, that an agent's knowledge can be imputed to a, pr a principal, and this is the Allen Realty Corp versus Holbert case, 227 Virginia 441 at 446, Ms. Hurd's counsel cannot cite any case law stating that a principal's knowledge is imputed to an agent. In other words, Mr. Waldman must have made the statements knowing that they were false or with reckless disregard as to whether they were false. And Mr. Depp's knowledge cannot be imputed to him. There is no evidence in the record that Mr. Waldman knew the counterclaim statements were false. Indeed, Mr. Waldman did not even know Mr. Depp or Ms. Hurd at the time of any of the alleged incidents at issue, and thus had no personal knowledge of what transpired. And this is reflected in the trial transcript that Mr. Waldman met Mr. Depp first in October of 2016, long after the fact. Nor is there any evidence in the record that Mr. Waldman subjectively entertained any serious doubts about the falsity of the counterclaim statements. Quite the opposite. The evidence shows, and it's unrebutted, that Mr. Waldman had very reasonable grounds to believe, and he did believe, and will to his dying day, that Ms. Hurd's claim of abuse were patently false. Mr. Waldman testified at length about 29 witnesses he believed disproved Ms. Hurd's false claims of abuse. 
uh, see the transcript at page uh, 6008 through 6012, and I won't run through all of that. But his testimony that two trained police officers, Officer Science and Haddon, were called to the penthouse on May 21, 2016, and saw no signs of injury on Ms. Hurd's face as well as, quote, Ms. Hurd's own witnesses who have testified in various forms at various times that there were no injuries to her face whatsoever between May 21st and May 27th, 2016, when she walked in to court with her publicist, her lawyer, uh, her former best friend who no longer speaks with her for a no-notice ex parte TRO. Some of the witnesses whom Mr. Waldman has cited, they include Laura DeVenier, Melanie Inglesis, who, as Your Honor recalls, is, was uh, Ms. Hurd's makeup artist, who decided to end any professional or personal association with Ms. Hurd. Uh, Samantha McMillan, Hilda Vargas, Isaac Baruch, Trinity Esparza, Cornelius Harrell, Alejandro Romero, and Brandon Patterson, just to name a few. No reasonable jury could find that Mr. Waldman acted with actual malice in making the allegedly defamatory statements. He was not present for the alleged incidents. He has no personal knowledge of any of the alleged incidents. What Mr. Waldman knows is a product of the legal work he did, the sleuthing he did on behalf of Mr. Depp. Ms. Hurd cannot possibly show that Mr. Waldman with acted with actual malice and her defamation claim must fail. Two, Mr. Waldman is an independent contractor, not an employee. It is axiomatic, Your Honor, that a person who hires an independent contractor is not liable for the independent contractor's actions. See Sanchez versus Medicorp Health System, 270 Virginia, 299 at 344. An independent contractor is a person who is engaged to produce a specific result, but who is not subject to the control of the employer principal as to the way to bring about that result. See Atkinson versus Sachno, 261 Virginia, 378 at 284. That's a 2001 case. An outside lawyer retained by a client in connection with litigation is an independent contractor. C. King versus Dalton, 895 F. Sup. 831, Eastern District of Virginia, 1995. Where Judge Ellis, a legendary jurist known by all Virginia practitioners, held that, quote, a law firm attorney working with a client is nonetheless an independent contractor and is not an employee of the client corporation. In that case, the employer was a corporation, but the same logic applies when it's an individual like Mr. Depp. That was Mr. Waldman's role. Indeed, clients hire lawyers to obtain specific results, or to try to obtain specific results, but they do not control the means by which the results are, are, in, are accomplished. Lawyers, as Your Honor has reminded us, are subject to professional obligations to exercise independent professional judgment. We, can, we are not at the whim of our clients as much as we want to serve them. See Virginia State Bar Professional Guidelines, Rule 1, colon 2, and 2.1. And just to quote 2.1, in representing a client, a lawyer shall exercise independent professional judgment, unquote. Mr. Waldman is, as a matter of law, an independent contractor, and Mr. Depp cannot be held responsible for any alleged tort by his attorney, particularly uh, for statements about which he was unaware until he was sued for them. Mr. Waldman testified, and it's unrebutted, that he has an employee he has his own law firm. He's not an employee of Mr. Depp. Mr. Depp and or none of his loan out companies have, have issued him a W-2. And Mr. Waldman provides legal services to clients other than in an addition to Mr. Depp. 
and that's found at the transcript, page 6020 through 21. All of that is unrebutted by Ms. Hurd. Mr. Waldman's statements, the third reason for which we respectfully submit the counterclaim should be stricken, is that Mr. Waldman's statements were protected opinion. And I won't run through all of that, but very briefly, taken in their proper context, the counterclaim statements are non-actionable expressions of opinion, entitled to protection under the First Amendment. See Gertz versus Robert Welchink, 418 U.S. 323 at 339. That's a 1974 case from the United States Supreme Court. See also Shacker v. Buffalt, a Virginia Supreme Court case found at 290 Virginia 83, a, two, a 2015 case, noting that where, quote, all sides of the issue, as well as the rationale for the speaker's view were exposed, the assertion of deceit reasonably could be understood only as the speaker's personal conclusion, unquote, and finding in an accusation of deceit to be opinion. In context, Your Honor, any reporter or any reasonable reader would understand and expect a lawyer associated with Mr. Depp, as Mr. Uh, Waldman was, to challenge Ms. Hurd's version of the inherently controversial events of the party's marriage. Just as Ms. Hurd's lawyers were, were quoted challenging Mr. Depp, and Your Honor will remember the context of these quotes that were in a British tabloid where Mr. Waldman's statements were buried well into article in which both points of view uh, were clearly expressed. And Mr. Waldman was clearly identified not as an independent expert on the US Constitution, but as one of, of Mr. Depp's attorneys. Uh, C. Chavez, uh, 230 Virginia 112 at page 119, quote, the most unsophisticated recipient of such a claim, i.e. any reader of the British tabloid, made by a competitor against another could only regard it as a relative statement of opinion grounded upon the speaker's obvious bias, unquote. Mr. Waldman has never done, never did anything to hide uh, his support and of and belief in Mr. Depp. Finally, Your Honor, and for the rest, uh, ultimately, Mr. Waldman's statements reflect the existence of two competing narratives and are merely his subjective view about events that he never claims to have witnessed. And there was no doubt about that. Turning to the second part of the argument, which will be more abridged, Ms. Hurd is not entitled to anti-slap immunity. As a threshold matter, Virginia Code Section 8.01-223.2, which is, as Your Honor well knows, is the Virginia anti-slap statute amended most recently in 2019, provides in relevant part, quote, the, uh, the immunity provided by this section shall not apply to any statements made with actual or constructive knowledge that they are false or with reckless disregard for whether they are false. Here, in addition to Mr. Depp's testimony, several witnesses have testified that A, they never witnessed Mr. Depp abuse Ms. Hurd, and B, that they observed Ms. Hurd without any injuries, marks, bruising, swelling, etc., during periods when Ms. Hurd claimed to have injuries, marks, bruises, etc. Such witnesses include, but are not limited to, Isaac Baruch, Kate James, Dr. David Kipper, Nurse Debbie Lloyd, Officer Sines and Haddon, Officer William Gatlin, and former U.S. Marine Starling Jenkins. Ms. Hurd's request for anti-slap immunity should be stricken, and even if there were disputing, even if there were disputed facts as to that, the anti-slap immunity does not apply because the defamatory implication of Ms. Hurd's statements are not solely relating to a matter of public concern 
as is required under the statute. As has become quite clear, Your Honor, Mr. Depp uh, is not suing about any of the pub public uh, policy commentary made by the ACLU when it drafted the op-ed, and Ms. Hurd put her name to it. What he is suing about here are the three statements that were directed at him. He has no issue with women's rights. He supports women's rights. In fact, he was the one, Your Honor, as Your Honor knows, who made that first $100,000 contribution to the ACLU, and he made it also to the CHL. Your Honor, at this point, I'm going to object. Um, Mr. Chu has largely just read his brief and confined his arguments to those directed in the motion, but like we saw with the last motion to strike, he's now directing his arguments to something other than what's at issue here, and I would object because I think making an argument not to you but to the cameras, it threatens, it's disrespectful to the court and to everyone's time, and it also threatens to undermine the integrity of this process and risk the jury being influenced by outside factors. Well, it, it's his argument. I'll allow him to do his Thank job. you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. As I was trying to say, what Mr. Depp is suing about are the three statements. And it's very clear, despite the pious opening statement that about the First Amendment, that with the testimony of Terrence Doherty, and the emails that were admitted as exhibits, that the ACLU and Ms. Heard were conspiring to make it very clear that those three statements were related to Mr. Depp, because otherwise nobody had any interest in the article. And it, it's crystal clear from that. They wanted to time this thing with the release of Aquaman, which was her first film of any significance in terms of uh, popularity. And to do that, uh, that's very clear. So the charade that this had something to do with public policy is risible. And that is not why the anti-slap protections were enacted. They were enacted to protect the rest of the article, not what Mr. Depp is suing about. As generally analyzed by the courts, a matter of public concern is one which relates to, quote, a matter of political, social, or other concern to the community, unquote, as opposed to a matter of only, quote, personal interest, unquote. That's Connick versus Myers, 461 U.S. 138 at page 146. Instead, the defamatory implication at issue in each of the three states, uh, statements at bar relate to the personal grievances between Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd, which does not rise to the level of a matter of public concern with broader implications for society beyond the two litigants in this action any more than Mr. Waldman's statements. I mean, the adding the gloss of public policy might immunize the statements that relate to public policy, but those are not at issue here. Mr. Depp agrees with those statements. We're talking about the three statements that they very intentionally and very cleverly put in to make it clear the implication that it was about Mr. Depp. They had lawyers from the ACLU working around the clock with Eric George to, make, to be as clever about this as possible. And Your Honor remembers the testimony of Mr. Doherty about the consternation at the ACLU when they realized that USA Today and everybody else who read the article knew darn well that this was about Mr. Depp. This cannot be protected by the anti-slap statute. It is a cynical runaround. And I think now that we have the undisputed evidence from from the ACLU in the form of the testimony of Terrence Doherty, who is not only their corporate representative, he was their general counsel. He is a brainiac lawyer. They knew exactly what they were doing, Your Honor. And one of the, he referred to testimony of a woman at the ACLU who said she had nightmares about Ms. Hurd, and he expressed no concern about that. Now, that was either because they knew about, she, that was either a reference to this game they were playing with the op-ed, or, the conspiracy they had to cover up her failure to make the donations. The donations became pledges, but now, but we have evidence that she refused to sign the pledge card. So she's caught either way. Simply stated, Your Honor, 
Mr. Depp is not suing Ms. Hurd for making statements about society in general. I think that's very clear from the record evidence. Mr. Depp is suing her for publicly naming him as an abuser by implication and forever tarnishing his good name, an act that, coming from an ex-spouse, is fundamentally personal in nature. For that reason as well, Your Honor, Virginia's anti-slap statute is not applicable. And based on the for foregoing, Your Honor, Mr. Depp respectfully submits that the court should grant plaintiff's motion to strike the counterclaims and also strike her claim that she is immune under the anti-slap statute. Thank you very Thank much, you. Your Honor. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. As Your Honor knows, the trial court is required to accept as true all the evidence favorable to Amber at this point, uh, as well as any reasonable inference a jury might draw therefrom, which would sustain the counterclaim. That's the correct standard here. Um, I'll address the actual malice argument first, the agency argument. Your Honor, there's plenty of evidence in the record from which the jury could determine that Mr. Waldman was Mr. Depp's agent. He made those statements. The statements referred to him as Mr. Depp's attorney. As Your Honor uh, ruled on Friday with respect to the jury instruction uh, conference, an attorney uh, is an agent of his client. Mr. Waldman testified that he's been Mr. Depp's attorney since 2016. Uh, he freely admitted speaking to the press on Mr. Depp's behalf, and he refused to answer question after question about that agency, so we can't use that as a sword now. Uh, Mr. Chu puts a lot of emphasis on the fact that Mr. Depp uh, allegedly didn't see the comments that were made uh, that are the subject of the counterclaim. But as Your Honor well knows, whether he saw them or not is not the standard for agency. Um, there's also evidence that Mr. Depp met with the Daily Mail with Mr. Waldman prior to the defamatory statements being made and released. I believe that was in February of 2020, just two months prior. Um, Mr. Waldman also concocted a story that Amber was being investigated for perjury by filing a perjury complaint against her with the LAPD. He disregarded any evidence that he didn't believe would fit in his narrative, that would fit in this story that he was speaking about on behalf of Mr. Depp. And after Mr. Depp lost the UK proceeding, after Mr. Depp was ruled to be a wife beater by the court in the, United, in the UK proceeding, the court there found him to be a wife beater. Mr. Waldman then got an overseas tabloid to run a story claiming that Amber was being investigated for perjury, which simply wasn't true. He walked into the LAPD, filed a complaint for perjury against Ms. Hurd, found a media outlet that doesn't follow the two source rule, and then he, he had <coughs> let the world believe that the LAPD was investigating Ms. Hurd for perjury. That's a shameful and a sickening example, Your Honor, of the links that Mr. Depp, through his agent, Mr. Waldman, would go to to smear and to defame Amber Heard. And that continued in the three statements in the counterclaim. Your Honor has heard evidence, <clears throat> I won't go through all the evidence, but Your Honor has heard evidence from Ron Schnell, who's traced the negative hashtags toward Amber Heard online associated with those defamatory statements, and notedly, noted the staggeringly high number of them that were associated with Mr. Waldman. Under the principles of the agent-principal relationship in Virginia, Your Honor, when Mr. Waldman made those statements, he was standing in the shoes of Mr. Depp. They are one and the same for the purposes of those statements. As Your Honor discussed at length on Friday, Mr. Waldman made these statements with actual malice. There's plenty of evidence from which the jury could infer that. And his own, both from the actual malice from Mr. Depp and Mr. Waldman's own reckless disregard of facts that didn't support Mr. Depp and his attempts to manufacture false evidence that did. As Your Honor found in the hearing, uh, I believe it was on March 24th, after Your Honor um, denied Mr. Depp's motion for summary judgment, Your Honor said, as to malice, a fact finder could reasonably conclude that Mr. Waldman made the statements with malice because Mr. Waldman has no personal knowledge of the party's marriage and still made the statements at issue. Nothing in this case has changed that. If anything, the evidence has only made it more clear that that is an inference that the jury can and we believe will find. Um, so, Your Honor, there's, there's, no, there's no basis to grant a motion to strike on this agency argument, on the actual malice argument. The evidence shows that not only was Mr. Waldman Mr. Depp's agent, but that the two of them conspired to falsely accuse Amber of creating a hoax and falsify evidence that they believed supported their, their theory and what they wanted to achieve. 
Um, as Your Honor well knows, too, I won't go through all the law, but both agency and malice can be inferred through circumstantial evidence. There's plenty of evidence in the record from which the jury could infer those. Moving on, Your Honor, to the independent contractor, the court's already rejected this argument, ruled that an attorney um, client have a principal agent relationship, and as Your Honor said on Friday, there's no evidence in this case of anything otherwise. As to the argument that the counterclaim statements are statements of opinion, the court has already found twice that they are not statements of opinion, both on January 4th, 2021, in its uh, opinion letter denying Mr. Depp's demur uh, as to the, the counterclaim statements, and at the motion for summary judgment hearing in March of this year. As the anti slap argument, the court again has already ruled at the March 24th, 2021 um, opinion that the statements are as a matter of law regarding matters of public opinion. Uh, the court has already ruled that. Therefore, the only remaining issue for anti slap is whether the intent element of immunity is met. The, as we discussed on Friday, the intent element of immunity is substantially the same as the actual malice standard, which uh, the evidence in this case. Uh, easily allows a jury to, uh, to to find in favor of Ms. Heard on that. Um, I won't go through the uh, the litany of evidence that supports uh, that Mr. Depp is an abuser here, but I'll touch on a few things that relate to Mr. Chu's argument. One, Mr. Chu was totally misrepresenting uh, Mr. Doherty's testimony. There's not a single piece of evidence, Your Honor, in this case suggesting that Ms. Heard and the ACLU were somehow conspiring to uh, achieve a defamatory implication to, to Mr. Depp. That's simply not what Mr. Doherty said. Mr. Chu's feel free to argue that to the jury, but that's not what his testimony reflects. Your Honor, there's also plenty of evidence that's been uh, adduced both in Mr. Depp's claim and in Ms. Heard's counterclaim that show that absolutely there was that the counterclaim statements are 100% false. There was no hoax perpetrated. Mr. Depp is an abuser who abused Ms. Heard. She did not conspire with her friends to create a hoax. She did not create a hoax herself. And just very briefly, uh, some of the evidence that's come up since the last motion to strike, Your Honor, that Mr. Chu conveniently disregards in this brief are the testimony of Rocky Pennington, the testimony of Josh Drew, the testimony of Elizabeth Mars, all of whom completely corroborate Ms. Heard's account of the events of May 21st, 2016. The testimony of Melanie Iglesias, who testified that she covered Ms. Heard, uh, Ms. Heard's bruises with makeup on right after the December 15th incident that provided ample testimony to support that Ms. Heard often would cover her bruises that were caused by the plaintiff in this case, by Mr. Depp, with makeup. He ignores the evidence of Christy Sexton. He ignores the evidence of Io Tillett Wright. He ignores the evidence of Whitney Enriquez. All of these witnesses and others have testified extensively about Mr. Depp's ex abusive behavior toward Ms. Heard. Physical abuse, emotional abuse, psychological abuse, verbal abuse, Your Honor. Mr. Depp's own writings, recordings, pictures, and videos confirm that. The list goes on. There's abundant ev evidence in the record, Your Honor, from which the jury could, and again, we believe will find, that Ms. Heard is not liable for defamation to Mr. Depp, and therefore, by definition, she, is, she has not acted with actual malice, and based on the court's rulings on March 21st, 24th, 2021, she would be entitled to anti-slap immunity, which would permit, permit her to ask the court to award attorney's fees against Mr. Depp. Um, so with that, Your Honor, I'm happy to answer any questions the court has. That's but fine. That Thank you, sir. It. Thank you. Right. Yes, sir. Your Honor, I will be brief in deference to the court's time and the jury's time. What Mr. Rottenborn said about Mr. Waldman's allegedly going to the LAPD about perjury is a complete non sequitur. If they thought that that were somehow improper conduct, they could have included it in their, their counterclaims. They included everything else but the kitchen sink, and most of it was thrown out. There was nothing in there about Mr. Waldman going to the LAPD, so that is a, a very clear non sequitur, red herring, distraction. Number two, when Your Honor ruled on summary judgment on the issue of the counterclaims, Your Honor was dealing with a different standard and a different evidentiary record. At that time, Mr. Waldman had not testified, which is material. Uh, Mr. Waldman has now testified uh, for purposes of trial. We have his trial testimony. 
It's very clear that he did not act with actual malice. They didn't even argue that. So that's pretty clear. Uh, and again, this is consistent. The third point is that it's, it's all about games. They didn't sue Mr. Waldman on the three statements. They didn't try to fill the hole. They've been telling us for a week that they're going to call Mr. Depp to try to fill the hole in their counterclaims. They didn't do that. And it's very consistent with the game playing. Let's go into court after the police have found no problem and after witness after witness who had no relationship with each other said there are no visible marks. Let's not give Mr. Depp's lawyer the required 24-hour notice before the TRO. Let's march into court with our publicist, with our lawyer, with our best friend who no longer talks to her. Let's get a TRO. And when the Me Too folks say, why are you taking $7 million from an abuser? They said, I didn't take money from the abuser. I gave it all to charity. Well, they didn't. I, I don't think anybody should feel bad about them stiffing the ACLU, given what the ACLU did in this case, which is a monstrosity. But she did stiff the sick and dying children. It, it is gamesmanship. And, and that's what she's doing here today. But the law is the law. And they have not fulfilled their burden with respect to the counterclaims. There is virtually no nexus between Mr. Depp and Mr. Waldman as to these statements at issue, except for the fact that he is an attorney. And that is not sufficient. In a case where they have not even established that Mr. Depp was aware of these statements. And they knew that they couldn't do it, and they didn't even try. And it's more of the gamesmanship when Ms. Hurd plays word games with Mr. Depp about, oh, I didn't punch you, Johnny. I just hit you. Imagine if the shoe were on the other foot and Mr. Depp, a man, was saying to a woman, oh, woman up. I only hit you. I didn't punch you. And when she, it was chilling when she warned him on the tape, you go tell a judge, you go tell a jury that you, a man, were abused. See if they're going to believe that. It is an abuse of the system, uh, and she's done it throughout. Finally, Your Honor, and Mr. Rottenborn makes an excellent point, with which I agree, which was that with respect to each of the three statements, Mr. Waldman was clearly identified, even by the tabloid that printed these, well within articles that had both sides represented, that he was Mr. Waldman's attorney. Even the reader of a tabloid understands that when you're getting statements from attorneys, it's going to be forwarding their client's point of view. Mr. Waldman is not the only attorney who has spoken out. Uh, Robbie Kaplan, who was um, Ms. Hurd's second attorney. So Ms. Hurd started out with Eric George. He made comments to the press. Objection, saying, Your Honor. Again, this is so much further beyond what Your Honor is addressing. I, I'm, finishing up, Your Honor. Okay, I'm, finishing. I'm finishing up, Your Honor. Okay. I'm finishing up. I'm finishing up. My point, Your Honor, and it's on point, is that Mr. George made statements supporting Ms. Hurd's position. Ms. Kaplan made very clear statements uh, supporting her client's position on the merits, and so did Mr. Waldman. But everybody knows when reading those that those are statements bipartisan. So for the reasons that we've stated and the reasons set forth in the brief, we respectfully sub, uh, submit that the court should grant the motion to strike or um, in light of the fact that Mr. Depp may reappear, at the very least, take these motions under advisement until the close of all evidence. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, thank you, sir. All right, in this matter, I've reviewed all the defendant's evidence as to her counterclaim and I've considered the arguments of her counsel and plaintiff's counsel. Uh, first, to address a few issues that I believe are outside the motion to strike, and that's as to the slap defense. The slap defense is just that it's a defense, so it's really not considered in a motion to strike. Um, having said that, we, I, we went down that legal road on Friday as far as the slap defense goes, as far as the jury instructions. In this particular case, if the plaintiff prevails, it must be with actual malice, therefore, if it's with actual malice, immunity does not apply under that statute. So um, we will deal with that with jury instructions, and we have. Um, as to independent uh, contractor, 
Uh, again, I think it's outside the motion to strike. However, Mr. Waldman was plaintiff's attorney since 2016 before the initiation of litigation. There is evidence that Mr. Waldman had a certain role during the prior divorce proceedings in the UK case. Additionally, there is evidence that shows his legal representation was broader than just a limited litigation uh, as outlined in all the cases presenting an attorney as an independent contractor. So the only evidence in this case to this point is that Mr. Waldman was an agent to Mr. Depp, and that is the basis uh, to weigh the motion to strike. <clears throat> as far as the opinions argument, again, um, I think that is outside the motion to strike. The opinions argument, the court has already ruled on this matter as to the three statements that are issued in the counterclaim, uh, ruled uh, that they were not opinion at the demur and at summary judgment. Um, so that argument um, will not be part of the motion to strike. So when assessing a motion to strike, the court accepts the favorable evidence adduced as true towards the non-moving party. The court cannot reject any inference from the evidence favorable to the non-moving party unless it would defy logic and common sense. When there is any doubt in question, the court should overrule a motion to strike. Agency may be inferred from the conduct of the parties and from surrounding facts and circumstances. When there is no direct evidence, circumstances may and usually are relied upon to determine whether an agency relationship exists. A principal is liable for the tortious acts of his agent if the agent was performing his principal's business and acting within the scope of his agency. If an agent's tortious act arises from their agency relationship as enacted in part to service the principal, the principal can be held liable for the tort. Here the alleged tort is defamation. Besides demonstrating the agency relationship, the defendant must prove Mr. Waldman published an actionable statement, meaning a statement that is both false and defamatory, with the requisite intent. As to agency, Mr. Waldman was plaintiff's attorney at the time of the alleged uh, defamatory statements were made. Mr. Waldman does not deny this, and neither does the plaintiff. Moreover, Mr. Waldman made the allegedly defamatory statements about the defendant during the proceedings of this action and interacted with the defendant once the statements were made while still representing the plaintiff. Taking the surrounding circumstances as a whole, an agency relationship can be inferred, and thus, thus a scintilla of evidence regarding agency must be turned over to the jury. In addition, the jury may infer, infer that Mr. Waldman made these specific statements to a third party to serve as plaintiff by portray, betraying defendant as an, oppos, an opposing litigant in a negative light. It is not disputed that Mr. Waldman published statements and that there is a question, there is a question as to whether statements are false, and both parties disagree and have presented conflicting evidence as such. As to actual malice, Mr. Waldman made the counterclaim statements after he met with his client. In addition, there is evidence the plaintiff was with Mr. Waldman at a meeting in February 2020 with the Daily Mail online. Further, defendant claimed that she met with Mr. Waldman where he threw the paper containing the counterclaim statements within them. Uh, consequently, there is more than a scintilla of evidence that a reasonable juror may infer Mr. Waldman made the counterclaim statements while realizing they were false or with a reckless disregard for their truth. It is not my role to measure the veracity or weight of the evidence. The Fourth Circuit and the Virginia Supreme Court have made it crystal clear that actual malice is a question for the fact finder. So therefore, the plaintiff's motion to strike is denied. Okay? Thanks, Thank you. Is there any yeah. other preliminary matters before the jury? Yes, Your Honor. Okay.
All right, are we ready for the jury then? Okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I apologize, we had a few housekeeping matters to take care of, but thank you. You can have your seat. All right, your next witness. Your Honor, on behalf of defendant and counterclaimant Amber Heard, we rest. All right, thank you. All right, rebuttal evidence? Yes, uh, Your Honor, Mr. Depp calls Walter Hamada of Warner Brothers. All right, Mr. Hamada. Your Honor, just to clarify, this is by deposition, so we may need oh, that. Okay, well, okay. Well, I apologize, I should have provided notice. <laughs> That's all right. Thank you, Your Honor. If we could get this, yeah. Um, what do you work for uh, Warner Brothers Entertainment Inc? Yes, I do. In what capacity? Uh, my title is president of DC based film productions for Warner Brothers. What, if anything, you did to prepare to testify for Warner Brothers as to topics two through 18? Um, I, I did not do anything to prepare for this other than my the meeting that I had with the attorneys. Did Warner Brothers have a contract with Amber Heard to perform in Aquaman 2? Yes, there, there was a, a, we had, op, we had an option agreement for her for Aquaman 2. Do you know what it is? It looks like a standard contract between a, a, an actor and, and the studio. And which actor was involved in this? Which which actor was a party to this contract? Amber. Uh, it's a contract for Amber Heard for the for the role of Mara in Aquaman and its sequels. Which studio contracted with uh, Amber Heard? Warner Brothers. When did you uh, come to be the president of DC? At the beginning of 2018, 2018. Mr. Hamada, was Ms. Heard ever released by Warner Brothers from the Aquaman 2 contract or the, what you call the option agreement? No. Was she released from her Aquaman 2 contract on or about February 22, 2021? Uh, no. Was Ms. Heard ever rehired for Aquaman 2 by Warner Brothers? No. Did Ms. Heard receive a pay increase for Aquaman 2? No. Why not? 
Uh, we, it, as a rule, <laughs> as a company, we make these, we go through a lot of trouble when we make our deals with our actors, where we get option, uh, we get options on them for subsequent movies. And I think traditionally, um, prior to me joining the company, every option was renegotiated. And one of the things that we were trying to put a rein in on was not renegotiating every deal uh, with the understanding that people come in and make these deals and they have an understanding that there will be options and that there is a deal in place. And it was a big part of our philosophy that we were going to hold people to their options moving forward. But did Warner Brothers at any point in time reduce Ms. Hurd's role in Aquaman 2? The role in the film that the size of the role in the film that she has was determined in the early development of the script, which would have happened in 2018, I would say. Well, so I mean, from there, beyond normal development, um, the, the role sort of, the character's involvement in the story was sort of what it was from the beginning. Was her role ever reduced for any reason? Um, no, I mean, again, from the early stages of the development of the script, uh, the movie was built around uh, the character of Arthur and the character of Orm, Arthur being Jason Momoa and Orm being Patrick Wilson. Um, so they were always the two co-leads of the movie. Did Warner Brothers ever plan to portray Ms. Bird as the co-lead in Aquaman 2? No, I mean, it was, it was, the movie was always pitched as a buddy comedy between uh, Jason Momoa and Patrick Wilson. Was Miss Heard cast in Aquaman? Yes, she was. Was Miss Heard cast in Aquaman 2? Yes, she was. Was Miss Heard paid for her services in Aquaman 1? Yes. Was Miss Heard paid for her services in Aquaman 2? Yes. Was her compensation for Aquaman 2 affected in any way by anything said by Johnny Depp? No. Was her compensation for Aquaman 2 affected by anything said by Adam Waldman? No. Was her compensation for Aquaman 2 affected by anything said by anybody representing Johnny Depp? No. Was there any delay in Warner Brothers exercising the option to cast Miss Heard in Aquaman 2? Uh, yes, there was. How long a delay was there? Um, I don't know, probably weeks. What was the cause of the delay? Uh, there were conversations about potentially recasting. Who was the producer? Uh, Peter Safran. Who was the director? Uh, James Wan. Did Warner Brothers believe that those concerns were legitimate? Uh, yeah, I mean, I had no reason not to believe the director and the producer of the movie. And you are testifying today as a representative of Warner Brothers, correct? Yes, I am. What, if any, creative concerns did Warner Brothers have about casting Amber Heard as Mira in Aquaman 2? It was the concerns that were brought up uh, at the wrap of the first movie, production of the first movie, which is the issue of chemistry. Did the two have chemistry? Um, you know, I think editorially they were able to, to make that relationship work in the first movie, but there was a concern that it took a lot of effort to get there. And would we be better off recasting, finding someone who had better, more natural chemistry with Jason Momoa uh, and move forward that way? Did Warner Brothers... Uh, take any steps affirmatively to audition other actresses for the role of Mira in Aquaman 2? No, we did not. 
Other than the creative concerns and concerns about chemistry you testified about, was there any other reason Warner Brothers delayed in picking up Ms. Herbert's option for Aquaman 2? No, it was all it was all concerns about whether she was the right bit of casting for the movie. What role, if any, did Ms. Hurd's dispute with Johnny Depp have in Warner Brothers' delay picking in picking up Ms. Hurd's option for Aquaman 2? There was there was none from our end. At any point in time, was Warner Brothers considering paying Ms. Hurd more money for Aquaman 2 than is set forth in the option contract you previously identified? No. As I said, we, we, were, we were determined to hold our actors to their option agreements. Would Warner Brothers have paid Ms. Hurd more money on Aquaman 2 if it had picked up her option earlier? No. At any time from the beginning of history through today, did Warner Brothers ever release Ms. Hurd from the Aquaman 2 contract? No. At any point in time from the beginning of history to today, did Warner Brothers rehire Ms. Hurd for Aquaman 2? No, because we just picked up her option. And, and when is the last time you spoke with Rob Cohen uh, relating in any manner to whether to exercise the option on Amber Hurd for Aquaman 2? No, it would have been the same time that I was having those conversations with Peter Safran. So in 2020. Did you speak with Zack Snyder at all relating to whether to exercise the option for Amber Heard on Aquaman 2? No, I've not had any conversations with Zack Snyder. Did you speak at all with Jason Momoa in preparation for your uh, deposition today? No. Have you ever spoken with Jason Momoa about any issues relating to chemistry between he and Amber Heard? Um, yes. When did you speak with Jason Momoa about chemistry issues between he and Amber Heard? It would have been in that same time period where we were prior to green light of the movie. Now, you were asked some questions about scripts. Uh, did you review any of the drafts of the script for Aquaman 2? Yes. When? I, I, part of my role is I read all those drafts of the scripts as they come in. When was the first script for Aquaman 2? Oh, okay. boy. I cannot tell you. Probably in 2018, the latter part of 2018 would be my guess. And how many versions of the script had been written by the beginning of 2021 for Aquaman 2? Oh, there, there were probably half dozen drafts of the script. Brought up. All right, what, if anything, did Rob Cowan say to you about chemistry? What specifically about the chemistry between Amber Heard and Jason Momoa? Just the, the fact that they didn't really have a lot of chemistry together. Um, you know, the, the reality is... It's not uncommon on movies for, for two leads to not have chemistry and that it's sort of movie magic and editorial, the ability to sort of put performances together and with the magic of, you know, a great score and, and how you put the pieces together, you can you can fabricate sort of that chemistry. Um, and so I think in, in at the end of the day, I think if you watch the movie, they look like they had great chemistry. But I just know that through the course of the post-production that it took a lot of effort to get there. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes it's very easy. You just put the, you know, characters on the screen together and they work. And sometimes it's harder. And so... Can you give me anything more specific about what it was with Amber Heard and Jason Momoa that was difficult for the chemistry? 
No, because it's 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 like what makes a movie star a movie star. Like you 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 know it when you see it, and the chemistry wasn't there. Now you've used the term fabricated a number of times. What did you do to fabricate the chemistry between Amber Heard and Jason Momoa? Oh, well, those are just it, it, it's editorial. It, you know, a good editor and a good filmmaker can pick the right takes, can pick the right moments, and put scenes together. Again, score is a big, you know, the music in a scene makes a big difference. It can make a happy scene feel sadder or a sad scene feel happier. Uh, and so it was sort of the, it's 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 just the magic of post-production, um, editing, sound, sound design, music, et cetera. And what, what do you mean by fabricating, though? I mean, were they literally falsifying or were they no. just picking the best no. music? Let me just let me finish my question. Um, were they picking the best music and picking the best looks because that's their job and that's what you do on every scene? That, that is what we do in, in post-production. That's what filmmakers do. They, they, no, they, yeah, they, 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 this is on any production you're doing that. You're, you're putting performances together. Sometimes it's either easier than others. Uh, this one uh, was more difficult um, because of the lack of chemistry between, between the two. Um, but they were able to, James Wan and the editor were able to get it to a place where the end result actually works, and it's great. And, in fact, that's the job of every filmmaker, right, is to put all of the course. combinations together to make the most successful production? Absolutely. I'll tell you what has been marked as uh, exhibit number five. It's ALH18247, and this is a text message exchange between James Wan and Amber Heard. And you mentioned James Wan was the director of Aquaman 2, is that correct? And Aquaman, That's correct. And Aquaman, the first one, correct? That's correct. All right. And uh, James is texting to Amber on August 25, 2018, you rated really high with the audience, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. Do you see that? Yes. This is August 25, 2018. What's going on on August 25, 2018 that would cause the director to send a, a text message to Amber saying... Um, that would be a test screening. We, so during our post-production of movie, we test the movie with an audience, and the audience tells us what they liked and what they didn't like. Uh, and so that's what he's referring to there. And they really liked Amber Heard, correct? Yes, she did. She tested well. It hit a billion dollars, is that correct? Exactly. Yeah. And more specifically, did you play any role in the determination to communicate to Amber's representatives that Warner Brothers was considering not exercising her option? Um, yeah, probably in the sense of we had the conversations, and I believe, if I recall, we had, uh, that's where Peter Safran offered to reach out to the agent uh, and express where, which direction we were leaning. Have you seen any document that says there was any chemistry issues between Amber Heard and Jason Momoa in Aquaman 1? Documents? No, I mean, those were all conversations. But if Jason came back and James Wan came back, you were guaranteeing that Amber Heard would play Mira, correct? That's correct. Okay. And Jason Momoa uh, was able to negotiate a different uh, a, a different compensation structure was he not for Aquaman 2 that's true he did he did renegotiate now Aquaman was the <coughs> highest grossing DC film ever for Warner Brothers was it not yes it was and what if any issues did you have with Amber Heard in Aquaman 2 Uh, my understanding is actually the production went very smoothly. All right, thank you. Your next witness. Your Honor, we call uh, Dr. Colburn next, but I know we have a preliminary matter that we need to deal with briefly. If we may approach, sure.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, I apologize again. We have a few things to take care of. We're just gonna go ahead and take our morning recess now for 15 minutes. Do not discuss the case and do not talk to anybody, okay? Do not do any outside research. Sorry, that was the same thing. If the doctor testifies, then is that WebEx? Yes. Oh, okay, so I'll get that set up too while we take the break as well. All right, All right. we'll go ahead and take a break. Let's make it 10.50 to give them time to look at everything, okay? Thank you, Roger. Thank you. All right.
Yes, sir. Okay. Approach. Ms. Meyer. Yes. Are you ready for the jury? Yes. Okay. Sir, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you count to five for me? One, two, three, four, five. All right. I'm just trying to get you on the big screen. We're waiting for the jury. Just give us a minute, okay, sir? Thank you. You can be seated. All right, your next witness. Uh, we called Dr. Kolber. All right, sir, if you could raise your right hand. Do you swear for him to tell the truth under penalty of law? Yes. Your Honor, I would just object that Dr. Kolber appears to have a sack of documents right in front of him. All right, sir, you can put your hand down and any documents you have, if you could put them away and just testify from your memory. Okay, sir? Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, your question. Good morning, Dr. Kolber. 
morning. Could you please state your full name for the record? David Allen Colbert. And what is your profession? I'm a plastic and hand surgeon. And how long have you been a plastic and hand surgeon? Been in practice for 26 years. Where do you currently work? At Cedars Sinai Medical Center. How long have you worked there? For the past 26 years. Do you know the plaintiff in this action, Johnny Depp? I do. And how do you know Mr. Depp? I had taken care of him when he had injured his hand. When did Mr. Depp become your patient? Sometime in March of 2015. And what type of treatment did you provide to Mr. Depp? He had a fracture of his finger with soft tissue loss. And so um, we reconstructed his finger. When did you perform, perform the first surgery on Mr. Depp's finger? I believe it was around March 20th of 2015. And what was involved in that surgery, just briefly? Debreeding the devitalized tissue, putting a hypothenar skin graft, store some of the soft tissue loss that he had, and then also putting a pin in because he had a displaced distal phalanx fracture. What was the state of Mr. Depp's hand immediately after that surgery? I'm sorry, I think the audio cut out a little bit. Could you please repeat your answer? It, w it was injured and um, had soft tissue loss and a fracture of his distal phalanx. And what type of cast was on Mr. Depp's hand after you performed that surgery? It was a plaster splint. And can you please describe to the jury what, what a plaster splint would look like? So it's, it's like a cast, but you don't want to put everything circumferential on it because of swelling after surgery. So I believe in Mr. Depp's case, it was like two fingers. I think the third finger was the one that was operated on. So these two fingers, the third and fourth finger are together. And it's a splint with plaster on the top and on the bottom that goes um, around the hand uh, to protect it. How mobile was Mr. Depp's hand when it was in that cast? Well, he couldn't move his third and fourth fingers because of the bulkiness of the splint. Typically, postoperatively, it's a more bulkier splint right after the surgery. So it's uh, not very, um, it gets in the way. Could Mr. Depp grab someone with that cast on his hand? <clears throat> I could, I, he could attempt to grab someone. I don't know how successful he would be he had his index finger free and his thumb free, but the other fingers were um, probably not being able to move. How long was the pin in Mr. Depp's finger? About 11 or 12 days. And how was the pin removed? It was removed under local anesthesia in my office. How long did you ultimately treat Mr. Depp for his hand injury? For several months. And why was that? It was a bad injury. Um, it required a few more little office procedures to clean up the tissue. He had an infection uh, as a result of the injury. So we had to be on antibiotics for some time until it finally completely healed. Do you recall when the infection developed? It was a few weeks after the surgery, and that's when I took out the pin. 
When was the last time that you saw Mr. Depp? Uh, sometime in 2015. I don't recall when. And when was the last time that you spoke to Mr. Depp? The same. Around 2015. Right. Thank you, Dr. Colbert. All right, cross-examination. Good morning, Dr. Culver. So you said that this plaster splint was put on, on after surgery on March 20th, 2015? Yes. And the, a, plaster, the yeah. a plaster splint, is that sometimes called half a cast? Sometimes it's called half a cast or a soft cast, something like that, yeah. And it's, it's made of plaster of Paris, right? Correct. And plaster of Paris hardens like a cast does, correct? Yes. So other than the fact that it's a little smaller than a cast that goes around your whole hand, it's just as hard as a cast that would be put on a broken arm or a broken hand, correct? Well, it's softer on the side, so the fingers can expand for swelling. So it's not fully, the plaster appears circumferential around everything. So there are areas that are softer to allow for swelling. But the parts that are covered with plaster of Paris are just as hard as any other cast, correct? Correct. And regardless of whether Mr. Depp could have grabbed someone with the hand with the cast on, he, he could have grabbed someone with the hand without the cast on, correct? Correct. Michelle, can you pull up exhibit 400, please? This has been admitted, Your Honor. All right. <clears throat> Permission to publish? Yes, yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Culber, I'm just going to ask um, Michelle here to just scroll through these pictures, and I'd ask you to take a look at them. Your Honor, I'm going to object for lack of foundation for these photographs. They're already in evidence. I, I, with respect to the questions to the witness. They're in evidence. S Thank you. S uh, Michelle, if you could go back up to that. Stop right there. Is there anything about the cast that was put on Mr. Depp's hand on March 20th, 2015 that would have prevented him from doing this damage to Ms. Hurd's closet on March 23rd, 2015? Objection calls for speculation. Overruled. I mean, he had his other hand available, so. No further questions, thank you. All right, redirect. Dr. Kolber, how many fingers were in the plaster portion of, the, of Mr. Depp's cast? I believe two or three. At least two were. And the third one and the fourth one. And why, why did you call it a soft cast? Because it's not fully, plaster doesn't go around the entire uh, hand because you allow for swelling. So there's plaster to protect the uh, fracture. So there's a little plaster on it, but it's on the top and the bottom, but it's not completely circumferential. So there's soft spots to it. And, and where are those soft spots located again? Usually we put a piece of plaster underneath the fingers and on top, and then the sides of the fingers, it's soft so that the fingers can swell after the surgery. Could Mr. Depp have hit someone with the hand that had the cast on it? He could have hit someone with it. It probably would have um, injured, damaged the cast. Did you ever notice any damage to Mr. Depp's cast when you treated him after the surgery? I, I don't recall. That's not, not nothing that comes to mind. Could Mr. Depp uh, form a fist with, with the cast on? No. 
No further questions. Thank uh, you, Dr. Kohler. All right. Thank you, sir. That completes your testimony. Thank you. All right. Your next witness. Yes. Plaintiff calls Richard Marks, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Marks. Sorry, just a reminder Sorry, that you're. Oh. Move it. Hold on, hold on. Just give us a second, and we'll see. No, sir, you've already just reminded that you're still under oath. Okay, sir. Morning, sir. Right. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Your Honor. Welcome back, Mr. Marks. Um, you've testified in this case previously, but would you just um, briefly remind the jury who you are? I'm uh, Richard Marks, and uh, I'm a uh, full-time entertainment transactional attorney. I make deals uh, every day for productions and for individuals. I'm in the trenches negotiating and then making sure the contracts reflect the deals, um, and I'm very much distinguished from uh, the other side's expert who is not an attorney, who's not in the trenches making deals, is not in that day-to-day -day process. And are you familiar with the testimony of um, Catherine Arnold in this matter? Yes. Have you been asked to analyze that testimony and provide opinions in response? Yes. And generally, what are those opinions? Well, my, my opinions are that um, uh, she's very uh, uh, slick and smooth, uh, but she's not an expert in deal making. Uh, her assessment of damages is built on nothing, and it's wildly speculative. Are you familiar with Ms. Arnold's opinion that it's customary for an actor to renegotiate the fee for a subsequent picture option in a multi-picture contract when a film is successful? Yes, I heard that opinion. And are you also familiar with her testimony that under those circumstances, an actor will renegotiate a 50 to 100% increase in their salary for the next optional film? Yes, I heard her say that. Do you agree with those opinions? Absolutely not. Why not, sir? Well, what we're dealing with in this case is a test option agreement. And that's an, uh, an agreement, uh, it's a multi-picture agreement, and it's the nightmare for people like me. You, the test is going to take place, let's say, for 10 actors the next morning at 9, and you have to fully negotiate a contract that might cover four movies and have it signed before they're allowed to test so that if they're chosen for the part, we have the full contract. There's no renegotiation. So you've got a contract for a multi-picture deal. It's usually a franchise. Uh, and uh, you negotiate the first movie. And normally, if they get the part, they're the chosen one. Uh, they're the stars born moment, if you will. Uh, they get the part, normally their salary is um, uh, inflated from their normal salary because now they're going to play a character that could go on for four movies. In this case, uh, Ms. Hurd's first salary when she got the part was $450,000. If Warner Brothers and DC Comics decided to make a next movie, um, they could recast her. They had no obligation. All they had was an option. But if they did cast her up front that they had uh, agreed to more than double her salary, like two and a quarter times to get to the million dollars, 
these are large uh, bumps, if you will. They're, if an actor is on a series, say, they go, and they have five options, they go up in increments of 5%, 10%, 20%, not these multiples that you see in uh, uh, a test option agreement. And that's one of the reasons that uh, they aren't renegotiated normally. They are in some instances, but not normally. What's the significance of the test part in a test option agreement? Uh, the, the test significance is that an established actor usually wouldn't test. They'd be offered the role. The, uh, Ms. Heard was in a group of actors that needed to be tested to see if the studio wanted to hire them. And then if they hired them, uh, they would be locked up for potentially for movies at very lucrative uh, increases because out after Aquaman uh, 1, she gets to a million dollars. Aquaman 2, she gets to two million dollars. And Aquaman 4, uh, 3, excuse me, you get to four million dollars. These are unheard of bumps if you're going on a normal career and trying to increase your salary by increments. In your experience, what is customary for negotiations of multi-picture deals? Uh, well, I think what happened in this case was customary for negotiation of multi-picture deals. Um, and by that, I mean that you assume success. The reason you go from the first Justice League movie where uh, Miss Heard played Mira the first time. The reason you more than double her salary is you assume success. So you've already built in uh, the bonus that uh, Miss Arnold was referring to, a renegotiation, if you will, for the third movie. Instead of doubling her salary, Miss Arnold said it would only be fair to quadruple her salary. Um, and that's just not the way these idiosyncratic contracts work. They're a very small portion of the contracts we deal with. Are you familiar with Ms. Arnold's opinion that Ms. Heard's salary for Aquaman 2 could have been renegotiated to around $4 million? I am. Do you agree with that opinion? No. Why not? Well, as I've said, that would now be after a healthy first payday it's more than doubled, and now it would be quadrupled. That's not the way it happens. Um, Walter Hamada, who is the president of the that part of the studio, said it doesn't happen. They're not going to do it. Um, Miss Arnold, for some substance, says, well, uh, Jason Momoa got to do it, but she doesn't give us any of the details. We know that Jason Momoa uh, was in a movie uh, uh, before the Justice League. He played Aquaman in a movie not opposite, not with Ms. Ms. Mira in that movie. So he had a history before the first movie with Amber Heard. He played Aquaman. We don't know what his contract, the state of it was when you got to Aquaman 2. And she says, unsupported, that he renegotiated. We're not sure what he renegotiated to. But I can say that at the end of the option period, when you've only got one option left, and you want that star in more movies, uh, you may renegotiate, but it's not a, a, a gratuity. It's, we'll give you more for the last option if you'll give us three more options. Uh, it's a give and take. And unfortunately, Ms. Arnold didn't give us any of that background uh, or those building blocks. And then I think yesterday she said, and the other actors renegotiated. And again, we don't know their salary history. We don't know their contracts. We don't know anything uh, except she's asking you just to believe her as what I refer to as a, a professional expert. 
Are you aware that Ms. Arnold's opined that but for the alleged defamatory statements by Mr. Waldman, Ms. Hurd would have earned $45 million in the last 18 months and then the next three to five years? Yes, I am. Um, I'd like to address some of the components of that um, one by one with you, Mr. Marks. Are you familiar with her testimony that Ms. Hurd would continue to make films um, for approximately $4 million each following Aquaman 2? Yes. Do you agree with that testimony? No. Why not? Well, again, in Aquaman 2, uh, uh, Amber Heard has already had this huge increase. She worked on Aquaman 2 for $2 million. What uh, Ms. Arnold is saying is, oh, she should have worked on it for $4 million, uh, which I disagree with. And I, I don't, I think there's, there is reasons to negotiate. They weren't here in this case. So the $4 million I have a disagreement with. But even if it was at four million, or if it was at two million, the f the four or five movies that uh, Miss Heard might get might be independent movies. They may might be standalone studio movies. They might be passion projects. Every actor has a, has yeah, a, a quiver full of quotes, and their highest quote is for the superhero. Um, fantasy uh, a journey, uh, their lowest quote might be for the independent passion project where they'll, they'll defer their salary and almost take nothing to work, just SAG minimum. Uh, and uh, to assume that she'd get four or five more movies at this, her last fantasy quote would be to assume that those are also those type of movies, playing another character. And uh, Ms. Arnold says that, that uh, Ms. Hurd's breakout moment, her, her star is born moment, is Christmas 2018. If that's true, and I don't think it's true, those moments no, don't normally happen to supporting cast, but if it's true, as a deal maker, you would expect if you represent producers, production companies, to flock in, to take advantage of this hot star and to sign them up. And we have from Christmas 2018 to spring 20, where there, there is none of this activity. The, the star is born phenomena didn't happen. Uh, Miss Heard starred in one series of eight episodes and she earned a healthy fee, $200,000 an episode. But that's five times less than the million uh, Miss Arnold is tossing out, supposedly based on Jason Momoa's quote. She doesn't prove it or, or give us facts. And Jason Momoa is not a comparable actor. He's been in a series where they shot 78 episodes, 44 episodes, 21 episodes. He played Conan the Barbarian. He was in Game of Thrones. Objection. It's not a objection, comparable. Your Honor, I'm unresponsive to. All right, I'll sustain the objection. Next question. Mr. Marks, we'll, we'll get to some of those um, issues in a moment, but um, I want to take you back for a second. I believe you testified a few minutes ago that um, your understanding is that the last option in a multi picture deal might be renegotiated under some circumstances. Do you have an understanding of whether um, Aquaman 2 was the last? option in Ms. Hurd's contract with Warner Brothers? Oh, no, no. Uh, Aquaman 2 has not even been released, and Warner Brothers has a fourth option for Aquaman 3 or another movie where Mira appears, that character, and they've agreed to double the salary again. So it's in success, and that assumes that they recast and that they make the movie. Are you aware of Ms. Arnold's testimony that Ms. Hurd would have made several million dollars on endorsement deals, um, such as the one she had with L'Oreal? I'm aware of that testimony. Do you agree with that opinion? No. Why not? Again, this is a business of personalities. Uh, we didn't, after the breakout moment that Ms. Arnold talked about, Christmas 2018, we didn't see endorsement deals flocking to uh, Ms. Hurd uh, during that 16-month period before 
Adam Waldman made a few statements in uh, the London Daily Mail, I believe it was. We didn't see those endorsements coming to her. We didn't, uh, what Ms. Arnold shows you is these non-comparable actors, they had endorsement deals, but she doesn't show you when she describes the breakout moment and why she's comparing Amber Heard to these, what I call, uncomparable actors, but she's making the comparison. She's saying, well, they had all these deals. Why wouldn't she? But for the statements that happened 16 months later, and I guess my primary question is what happened in the 16 months, even if you believe three statements in the Daily Mail uh, are the stake through the heart of this uh, stars born moment. Do you have an opinion about Ms. Arnold's testimony that Ms. Heard would have made $1 million an episode um, in a couple of streaming series following her um, A Star is Born moment? Yes, I, I heard it. I have and an opinion. What's your opinion? Well, after Aquaman won, this is a major coup. Amber Heard got that role. She tested for it. She could have been the other 19 actresses or 10 or whoever else tested. Didn't get it. She got the role. And she got her salary uh, doubled for uh, Aquaman 1 to a million dollars. Now, Ms. Arnold wants you to believe that that million dollars would translate into, she'd get that for each episode of a series. We know what she got for a series. She got a series uh, in that period after Christmas 2018, before uh, spring of uh, 2020, she got a series. It was eight episodes, and it was $200,000 an episode. And Miss Arnold is from somewhere, in, in, in a glib way, saying she got a couple series and a million each. And I can tell you, as a, someone in the trenches, rarely, rarely does an actor get a million dollars for a series episode. Uh, and, um, and again, in those 16 months, there were no offers for series at a million dollars an episode. In fact, her, her only series is the 200,000. And if you look at her resume, the series that Miss Heard were in, I think the longest one ran eight episodes. Jason Momoa, if you were to believe Miss um, Arnold and somehow Jason Momoa's agent broke their confidentiality in the agreement and he had a series at a million dollars an episode, if you're to believe that, Jason Momoa has had a series with 78 episodes, with 44 episodes, with 21 episodes, with 18 episodes, with 21 episodes. He was in, again, there's not a comparableness there. We spoke a few minutes ago about the test option agreement. Um, what's the significance of the option part of that agreement? The option part of the agreement uh, gives the employer, the studio, the option. Uh, they don't have to do anything. Uh, they have an option to either employ you at a very healthy salary to play this role or not. They can recast the superhero role. You just have to think of how many actors have played Batman or Superman. They, uh, they can do what they want. And indeed, since there's no contract, they only have a choice to exercise their option or not. They might say, we're not exercising unless you reduce your compensation. Who knows what the negotiation would be but it's not a contract until the studio exercises the option and they don't have to. Um, what's the alternative to an option agreement? Well, the alternative is most agreements in Hollywood, you're hired to play the role. Uh, or once you exercise the option, then it becomes for that picture an agreement like others in Hollywood you are now hired to play that role. So most contracts are guaranteed, you're hired to play the role, 
In an option agreement, once they exercise the option, for that movie, it becomes a guaranteed contract. Are you aware that Ms. Arnold testified that Ms. Hurd was released from her Aquaman 2 contract and then subsequently um, rehired? I heard that testimony. Is that consistent with your experience in the film industry in connection with these um, multi-option contracts? No. Why not? Again, studios uh, don't do things they don't have to do. As we heard Mr. Hamada, the president of the studio, say, uh, you either exercise your option or you don't. They exercise their option. He denied releasing and then rehiring. And in my experience, in almost five decades in the business, doing this type of work, not talking about it, not consulting. I mean, I have, you know, I, I heard Ms. Arnold say she'd been an expert a hundred times. That's, I'm a, I'm a transactional lawyer. I do this occasionally. Uh, basically, um, uh, you know, it's, it's not a contract till they uh, option it. And, and they, they pick up their option. And at that point, it's a guaranteed contract. And then different, different uh, rules apply to it. In your experience in the industry, do studios typically comment on those types of um, actions that they're taking with respect to options? No. Uh, just like Mr. Hamada said, they don't need to comment on it. They either exercise the option or they don't. Ho in Hollywood, silence is the default. Uh, you play no card before it's time. And the, and the cards there were exercise the option or not. And I was surprised by Mr. Hamada under oath, basically saying that there was this discussion of chemistry. That Ob objection, Your Honor, hearsay. I think it was um, it was an in court statement this morning. I believe, Your Honor. <laughs> That's fine. It's the same hearsay that you were. It's hearsay like yesterday. I mean, it's, it's hearsay. I'll overrule the objection. Go ahead. Thank you. I didn't hear. Go ahead, sir. Overruled. You can continue, Mr. Oh, I was surprised to hear Mr. Hamada say that they they talked about uh, chemistry. That would normally be behind closed doors uh, because it can't help your relationship with the actor. You're either going to exercise or not, and um, that was um, uh, quite a bit of candor from someone at his level. And so, therefore, I I. Uh, uh, take it at face value. I, I think he felt that he was under oath and he was telling the truth, but it okay, wouldn't be. Objection, Your Honor. Is I'll sustain the objection. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Marks, are there circumstances where a studio would be more likely to say something about not using an actor again in a franchise? Yes. What are those circumstances? Once they've exercised the option, once the contract is guaranteed, the studio still has the right to pay the actor, but not play them, pay or play them. And that is a rare condition because you've hired the actor, you've got to pay them, but you say, go home, we, we're, we're recasting. In that situation, after you've exercised the option and the contract is guaranteed, if you uh, pay off the actor, that's normally common on that becomes a bit of information because it's not normal. Is that circumstance different from uh, Ms. Hurd's contract with Warner Brothers for the Aquaman movies? Oh, yeah, yeah. M Ms. Hurd's contract, again, it was just an option. Either we exercise it or we don't. And if we exercise it, she's in the film. If we don't, she's not. Until we exercise it, we have our right to recast or not make the movie. And even after we exercise it, we'd still have a right to recast and not make the movie. We just have to pay her her salary. Do you understand that Ms. Arnold um, compares Ms. Hurd's career trajectory with that of other actors, including Jason Momoa, Gal Gadot, Zendaya, Ana de Armas, and Chris Pine? I heard that. 
And what's your opinion of those actors um, as comparables for Ms. Heard? Uh, even Ms. Heard's agent, Jessica Kay, said that four of those actors weren't Objection, comparable. Objection, Your Honor, here's that. Um, I believe the same um, response, Your Honor, that it was in testimony that was played in court earlier this week. I mean, he, I, that's not what she testified to. I mean, he's, he's characterizing testimony that was from days ago, and I don't even think she testified to that, Your Honor. But you can, you can cross-examine overruled. Overruled. Um, you may continue, Mr. Uh, again, uh, they are not comparable. Jason Momoa was Aquaman. Uh, Chris Pine was Captain Kirk. Gal Gadot was Wonder Woman. Zendaya has been working on Disney Channel since she was 13. Uh, she's in all the Spider-Man movies. She goes by one name. Uh, Anna de Armas, uh, you know, when she was in uh, a movie uh, that they call, uh, you know, her breakout, uh, it was as a, a nude poster. She's been an ensemble piece, Knives Out, these are not comparables. Now, Ms. Arnold stuck to Jason Momoa, who's the most non-comparable because of his history and his career, but she didn't give us the advantage of, of telling us what his contracts were, what he renegotiated to, what he earned. She didn't give us any of those building blocks. She just created, she set him up as a comparable and then said what Ms. Heard should earn, but she never gave us the salary of Jason Momoa or the other comparables. And uh, she built like this house of cards on nothing. Uh, you know, she showed us the, the, with her words, the beautiful clothing that the emperor was wearing. But, but we could see, if you know the business. The objection, Your Honor. Should that he wasn't. Go beyond the scope of the question. All right, I'll sustain the objection. Next question. Okay. Um, you were just speaking about uh, Mr. Momoa as a comparable. Are you aware that um, Ms. Arnold compares uh, Ms. Heard to uh, Mr. Momoa as an actor with equivalent franchise experience who was able to renegotiate his salary for significant increases in bonus? Yes. What's your response to that opinion? Again, he didn't have comparable uh, franchise experience to, to Ms. Heard. He was Conan the Bar Barbarian. He played Aquaman in a movie that Amber Heard was not in. He played Aquaman, not a supporting character like Mira. It's just not comparable. Um, and you can say the words, but, but I saw nothing from Miss Arnold to back it up, something to build on, which if she was a negotiator in the trench, uh, the, the studio negotiator would say, okay, so show us, you know, where's the comps? Let's talk numbers, because ultimately that's where we have to get to, not just because you say it so, we just don't believe you, you've got to show us. In your experience in the industry, what factors um, influence the negotiation of the terms of a film, film agreement with an actor? Well, I mean, first, it depends on the film. If the film is a million-dollar movie and everybody's deferring their salaries, that's one thing. If it's a superhero movie, that's another. But for deal makers and negotiators, the best predictor of what the deal should be is past earnings, uh, precedent, comps. Uh, you also look at the budget of the movie, what it can bear, because if uh, uh, Jason Momoa's comp is $10 million, but the budget's $10 million, obviously he has another price for that movie. But the best predictor of future earnings is past earnings. And I didn't see any, Miss um, uh, Arnold talk about past earnings at all, except the earnings in this rarefied superhero four-picture deal where instead of incremental increases, which you normally see, uh, uh, it was uh, multiples increases. And then when you get on a series, the big renegotiation is was when the network has no more options. 
Until then, the actors on the series get five, 10, 15, small percentage raises. They don't get multiples. They get the multiples if it's success and the studio wants to continue making the series and they want to keep these characters. That's when the renegotiation happens. Here, even if we believe Ms. Arnold, after Aquaman 2, there was still an option waiting at a big price, uh, uh, you know, double the, the previous payday. What's the significance of the timing of the Waldman statements to the opportunities Ms. Arnold claims Ms. Heard lost? Well, the argument, as I understand it, uh, is that uh, Ms. Arnold says that Ms. Heard lost all these opportunities because of they, that, that those losses were caused by uh, uh, Adam Waldman's statements 16 months later. So I think the timing. Sure. Mr. Marks, what's your overall assessment of Ms. Arnold's opinions in this case? Uh, my overall assessment of her opinions is that they're not worth the paper they're not written on. She knows something about our business, but not about negotiating deals. She may have uh, gotten someone at the, more, at the Endeavor office to uh, breach confidentiality, but she objection. never laid out the, the building block. Objection. Excuse me, objection. objection. You have to stop talking, Mr. Marks. Thank you. Um, beyond the scope. Yeah, Mr. Marks, can you okay. just limit your, um, limit your testimony to your opinion about um, okay. Ms. Arnold's opinions, please? My opinion as someone who's made deals uh, as a deal maker for almost 50 years is that uh, she calls herself an expert, but she's not. She uh, doesn't have the background. She doesn't have the day-to-day -day, uh, knowledge. And her testimony that I heard did not back up her bottom line. If you want to get those figures, you have to show why uh, they're deserved. And again, uh, it, it, she was constru constructing a Jenga without the bottom uh, pieces. It, it does not hold up under scrutiny by someone who makes deals. No further questions. All right, cross-examination. Good morning, Mr. Marks. Good morning. <clears throat> so you agree that studios use comps to negotiate deals, correct, with actors? Sometimes they do. Okay. And you have an issue with the comps that um, Ms. Arnold used, correct, as you testified to? I have an issue with the comps that she says she used that she didn't disclose. The comps being the actors that you just talked about. She did disclose, I mean, she disclosed the actors. She disclosed the actors and budget figures from their movies. She never disclosed their salaries and salary history as comps. Did, you're not offering a different set of comparators that should be used, correct? I'm saying if you are going to... That's not my question. Are you offering a different set of comparators than what Ms. Arnold used? I, I'm, I'm not uh, here offering uh, comparators. I'm saying what she offered not offering, or not comparators. That, that, was my, that was my question. You're not offering comparators, correct? No. I would say that Ms. Heard's comparisons sir, sir, are where you are. That was my question. 
motion to strike after the oh, no. all right we'll strike after that just answer the questions mr marks thank you now you're a deal you're a deal maker correct yes what actors have you negotiated for in superhero movies uh well recently uh, i've acted i've negotiated for um uh chris pratt in a, a superhero series for amazon i've negotiated uh, a deal for uh Michael Douglas, not in a superhero movie, but a, a historical movie. I've negotiated recently uh, a deal for Paul Rudd and Will Ferrell on, a, on an Apple series. Uh, Billy Crudup on an Apple series. Have Those you, are the recent talent deals. What actors have you negotiated for a superhero movie? movie? Um, as I sit here now, I can't remember a superhero movie uh, that I've uh, uh, negotiated. Uh, I've certainly negotiated over my career um, uh, franchise movies uh, and fantasy movies. Uh, uh, Your Honor, uh, so it's no, you haven't negotiated with any for any actors for superhero movies, correct? So you would define like um, uh, I don't know, Jungle Book uh, isn't a superhero movie. It's more of a fantasy. Okay. So, so, no, correct. Your answer okay. is not. All right. So as I sit here, I can't think of a, of a, of a uh, Marvel-type superhero movie that I've uh, negotiated, uh, although I know there's one or two in yeah. there. Now, you testified and you agree that Mr. Momoa negotiated his multi-picture contract for, for Aquaman 2, correct? I heard uh, Mr. Hamada say there was a renegotiation, uh, but no facts were uh, uh, pro-offered, such as he didn't have an option, uh, his options were out, what he was earning and what he renegotiated to, and he is Aquaman man. So yes, I did hear there was a renegotiation. And you understand that his salary went from three to four million to $15 million. Uh, if you tell me that, I haven't seen his contract and I haven't heard any testimony under oath uh, that that's where the leap was. Now, Ms. Hurd's contract... Did, he get more, did Hurd, they get more options for Ms. when Ms. they made Hurd, that leap? Did they get more options? Ms. Hurd's contract was a talent option contract, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and you agree that for the... Aqua, if there's an Aquaman 3, Ms. Hurd would have an option to receive $4 million, correct, for the movie? Well, actually, you would language it, Warner Brothers would have the option to engage her. And if they engaged her, she would receive $4 million, correct? Yeah. She doesn't have the option to refuse. They have the option to engage her. And she would receive $4 million, correct? Yes, $4 million. Would you agree that the money Amber was making on Aquaman 2 or 3 would be her market rate for future studio movies? I would think it would be her rate for su uh, future studio superhero movies, uh, but not necessarily studio movies that aren't superheroes. That could be standalone. That could be other type of studio movies. But for super, but for studio superhero movies, it would be four million dollars, correct? If I was uh, uh, Miss Hurd's agent, that's where I would start, okay. assuming everything was equal the budget of the superhero movie, that she was uh, in the ensemble. There's a lot of uh, ifs to look at, but all things being you, equal. You agree that Aquaman was a breakthrough role for Miss Hurd, wasn't it? Uh, it's, it's the first movie of that ilk that she makes, but she is not Aquaman. She is Mira. But it was a breakthrough movie for Miss Hurd, correct? For, for her, it's a breakthrough movie to be in that film and in the ensemble. Absolutely. And she was the female star of that, of that movie, correct? I believe so. You would agree that for all of the actors Ms. Arnold listed as comparables, their career trajectory went up after their breakthrough, correct? She didn't give us the raw materials to look at, but I'll take your word that all those unrelated actors in unrelated films, except for Jason Momoa, they went up. 
in your experience, as did Miss Arnold's in, in, when in, she in, went from one to two. In your experience, can you identify an actor or an actress who's not been able to get a new studio movie after a breakthrough performance in a superhero movie? Uh, as I sit here now, I haven't been asked to to opine on that, but there are lots of supporting characters in movies that don't appear in the next movie. The, but the but a female star in a breakthrough movie in a superhero movie, can you identify any actress who's not gotten another studio movie after that? Uh, well, after Miss uh, Hurd's breakthrough in 2018, she did get Aquaman 2. Aquaman and, 2 and, was already, she okay. already had the option for Aquaman 2. All right, correct. so she did, uh, Miss Hurd did not get any movies after uh, 2018, long before the Adam Waldman statement. Other than Miss Hurd, can you identify any actor or actress who's not gotten another studio movie after their breakthrough in a superhero movie? As I sit here now, I haven't been asked to research that, and I, and I can't. That okay. would be a normal uh, a thing. And you're, you're not providing an alternative number for Miss Hurd's damages, correct, for the jury? Correct. I'm not uh, providing an alternate number. I think, uh, you know, she's been more than uh, adequately paid. I, I'd move to strike after. No, I've not been provided another number. That's all. I mean, my question was you're not providing another number. I think it's in fairness in the full answer of the question, Your Honor. It was a, it was a yes or no question. He said his answer was no. I'm not going to strike it. Okay. All right. No further questions. All right. Redirect. Um, Mr. Marks, uh, in response to some questions from Mr. Ladehaft, you were um, discussing some franchise and fantasy uh, movie agreements that you've negotiated with uh, actors. Could you just describe some of those for us? I, you know, I've had such a long career that I mainly forget what I've done, but. I negotiated all the contracts for uh, uh, Pinocchio, if you will, that was produced. Uh, you know, um, uh, you know, is coming to America the the original? Is is that a fantasy movie? The Golden Child is that a fantasy movie? Uh, uh, yeah, and and by the way, I may have negotiated contracts, uh, and ultimately the film wasn't made. Uh, but as I sit here now, uh, those are the only ones that come to pass. If I was looking at my, my resume or uh, going through my files, I might think of others. But there isn't a deal that I haven't made. And I think you also um, testified in response to Mr. Nadelhaft's questions that you um, have negotiated some deals for um, Chris Pratt and Paul Rudd. Do you recall that testimony? Yes, these are for a streaming series. Do you happen to know if both of those actors have played Marvel superheroes? I believe uh, uh, they they have, but don't quote me because, you know, that's not my genre. Okay. Um, no further questions, Your Honor. All right. Thank you, Mr. Marks. You can uh, you're free to stay in the courtroom, or or you can leave. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Your next witness. Plaintiff calls Michael Spindler. Michael Spindler. Testified previously, correct, Mr. Spindler? All right. Just a reminder that you're still under oath, okay, sir? Yes. All right, thank you. Right. Yes, sir. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Spindler. Good morning. Uh, can you remind the jury who you are and what you do? Yes, I'm Michael Spindler. I'm a forensic accountant. I'm a CPA, a certified fraud examiner, amongst some other certifications. I'm uh, with uh, B. Riley Advisory Services, a national firm that does forensic accounting, bankruptcy and restructuring work, and business uh, valuations and appraisals. I've got over 40 years of experience. Are you familiar with the testimony rendered by Ms. Arnold in this matter? Yes, I am. Do you understand that Ms. Arnold testified that Ms. Hurd has suffered economic damages resulting from three statements made by Mr. Waldman? Yes, I do. Do 
Do you have an opinion of that claim? I do. All right. Thanks, Mr. Spindler. Now, you indicated that you would listen to Ms. Arnold, and she testified on behalf of uh, Ms. Hurd relative to economic damages. Have you formed an opinion as to the testimony and opinion rendered by Ms. Ar by Ms. Arnold? Yes, I have. And what's that opinion? It is not adequately supported, and it is unreasonable. There were multiple elements to that analysis, uh, both damages that related to her film career and to endorsements. Have you analyzed both those issues? Yes, I have. What is your opinion of the claims that have been asserted relative to the film career and endorsements? Okay, well, first of all, with respect to her damages, calculation. There was no calculation, per se. Um, she initially looked at these comparable actors and seemed to use that as a basis for numbers. She didn't provide the underlying calculation. She didn't provide underlying support. Uh, and then it appeared as though uh, in her testimony, she backed away a little bit from that, but she still suffers from the issues of not providing detailed calculations or support for where those numbers come from. And she still, to some extent, appears to be using some kind of comparable analysis. All right. What is the type of analysis that you think is appropriate here? Well, I think, and as you heard from the last witness, I think that something that is anchored in facts, uh, taking a look at historical compensation as a basis for anticipating future compensation. Had you looked at Ms. Hurd's prior compensation? Yes, I have. I've looked at uh, tax returns that were provided for the period of 2013 through 2019. Why do you want to use historical earnings? Well, once again, you want an analysis is anchored in fact. Uh, I don't believe that Ms. Arnold has done that in her analysis. So here we've got some actual data, we've got some historical compensation, and as the last witness mentioned, that often provides somewhat of a basis for future anticipated earnings. In addition, uh, I believe that Ms. Arnold herself said that she had hoped to be able to look at a renegotiated salary for Aquaman 2 and then use that as a basis for future compensation, that being uh, the new kind of base, if you will. All right. Were there any years in particular that you focused on in your analysis as to uh, Ms. Arnold's testimony? Uh, in terms of uh, the, the historical compensation? Yes. Well, for 2013 through 2019 in total, her compensation was around $10 million 
for all those years combined. Uh, in 2019, the last of those years, her compensation was uh, somewhere between about $2.6 million and $3 million. Now, that's a good year. That's known as a clean year. What do you uh, mean by a clean year? Well, you know, for example, 2019, you had Aquaman was released in December of 2018, and that was a successful film. So in 2019, you've got the benefit of that kind of success, uh, and you also don't have the, any potential impact from the alleged defamatory Waldman statements that uh, occurred in April of 2020. So 2019 is clean of all that. What did you understand Ms. Arnold's methodology to be? Her methodology initially appeared to be based on these comparable actors that she had identified. And theoretically, the compensation that they earned, although she doesn't identify what that compensation is or provide any support for it or any calculations. What is your opinion of that methodology from an accounting perspective? Uh, that methodology was unsound. It's just unsupported. Uh, there are no numbers. There's no data that she provided as support for that. What methodology did you understand Ms. Arnold to adopt at trial? Okay, well, it looked like somewhat of a mix and match approach. She used different approaches, I believe, for different elements of the damages, although it's, it's still a little bit unclear to me, a little bit vague. But uh, there are four basic components that she was looking at, uh, and uh, we can go through those in, in any order you wish. All right. With respect to the television series, series portion of her analysis, what do you understand uh, that methodology to be? Okay. Objection, Your Honor. May we approach? All right.
uh, earnings from television shows. What was, did you analyze what historical earning um, Ms. Hurd had during the period that you were concerned with relative to television shows? Well, yes, during 2019, she entered into a contract in July of 2019 to uh, appear in a television series at $200,000 per episode. All right. What about endorsement deals? Did you look at what she had made on endorsement deals during that period? Uh, she did have a contract with L'Oreal uh, at $1,625,000. All right. With respect to her movie roles, what were her, her historical earnings during that period? Well, uh, certainly for the most recent years, you had the, um, the Warner Brothers deal, which was a four-picture deal. The first film was $450,000. Then the first Aquaman was $1 million fee, base fee then $2 million for Aquaman 2, and uh, presuming that there was an Aquaman 3, that would have been $4 million. Okay. Um, why do you look at historical earnings as part of your analysis? Because you want your analysis to be anchored in facts. Uh, you want it to have a sound methodology, and you want to come up with a reasonable result. So if you take a look at, for example, um, the analysis that Ms. Arnold did, it didn't okay, appear no, to be... Let, let's, let's just look at the analysis that yep. you're doing. Um, so um, what you said, I think, is you wanted them anchored in facts. Why? Because that provides a sound basis for coming up with something with reasonable certainty. Uh, there's AICPA, or American Institute of Certified Public Accountant, guidance with respect to reasonable certainty. And those are the basic elements of it. Thank you. No further questions. All right. Cross-examination. Hello again, Mr. Spindler. Good morning. I'm going to ask you a few questions that may refer to the statements in Amber's counterclaim against Mr. Depp. Um, when I refer to those statements, I'm going to refer to them as the Depp Waldman statements. Do you agree that we can both be on the same page what I'm referring to when I say that? Uh, that's fine. You can I'm use sorry. your terminology. I'm sorry, there's an objection, sir. Hold on. Can we approach? Okay. So, Mr. Spindler, when I refer to the Depp Waldman statements, you understand me to be referring to the statements in Ms. Hurd's counterclaim against Mr. Depp, correct? I'll understand that, yes. Now, you're, you're here to provide a, a rebuttal opinion to Ms. Arnold's, part of Ms. Arnold's testimony, correct? Correct. You're not providing opinion on whether Ms. Hurd suffered defamation by Mr. Depp, correct? That is true. You're not offering an opinion as to what any of the underlying facts relating to whether Mr. Depp abused Amber, correct? That's correct. You're not offering an opinion as to the magnitude of damages that you believe Ms. Hurd may be entitled to if she proves defamation by Mr. Depp. You're just reviewing what Ms. Arnold has said, correct? That's correct. And you said that you want your analysis to be accurate in, in facts, right? Anchored in facts. Anchored in facts. 
you'd agree that what an actor earns in one period isn't necessarily reflective of what he or she may earn in future periods, correct? Correct. It, and that's because there can an, increase be some variability. In roles, yes. an increase in the number of roles may lead to greater income, correct? I'm, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I was, I was speaking, I didn't hear. One of the reasons that what you earn in one period may not be reflected of reflective of what an actress may earn in future periods is because an increase in the number of roles may lead to greater income, correct? The number of roles or the particular project itself, yes. Sure, getting better roles may lead to greater income, correct? Correct. And the same is true for an endorsement. As, as an actress's profile grows, the amount of money that she may be able to earn from endorsements grows as well, correct? It can. So it depends. what Ms. Hurd earned from, say, 2013 to 2019 that you testified to isn't necessarily reflective of what she might earn over the next five years, correct? Not necessarily. It is a good indicator, though. And you'd agree that from 2013 to 2019, in terms of earnings and star power, that Ms. Hurd's career trajectory was on the upswing, correct? There was a, a, a slight increase during that period of time in her earnings from 2013 through 2019. And you'd agree that that was as a result of getting more lucrative roles, right? Yes. Now, you're not a causation expert, right? You're just a damages expert? That's correct. So you're not testifying as to whether the Depp Waldman statements caused her to lose any roles, correct? That's correct. And you're not offering any opinion as to whether the Depp Waldman statements kept her from being considered for roles that she otherwise would have been considered, considered for, correct? That's correct. I'm not testifying on causation issues. And you can't speak to what opportunities may never have materialized for Amber as a result of the Depp Waldman statements, correct? Uh, yeah, I've not done those calculations. And you don't have an opinion about whether or not Ms. Hurd could have renegotiated a contract for Aquaman 2, correct? That was not part of my work. And you don't have an opinion on the impact that additional exposure or press coverage or magazine covers or interviews would have had on Ms. Hurd's career, correct? Correct. I'm just looking at Ms. Arnold's calculations. You've never served as an expert witness before to calculate damages based on lost roles by an actress resulting from defamation against that person, correct? I've been involved in defamation cases, but I've not done uh, the calculations as an expert witness and testified there too. And there's never been an instance in which you have served as an expert witness in a case to calculate damages based on alleged defamation against an actress, correct? Correct. And you're not offering any expert opinion on what impact the alleged defamation by Mr. Depp has had on Ms. Hurd's career, correct? Uh, I'm sorry, one more time? You're not offering any expert opinion on what impact the Depp Waldman statements by Mr. Depp has had on Ms. Hurd's career, correct? Other than taking a look at Ms. Uh, Arnold's uh, calculations. And you're not offering any expert opinion about what impact, if any, social media coverage of this case or of Ms. Hurd may have had on Ms. Hurd's career, correct? You're correct. That's other experts. Can we approach No further on? questions. Thank you. All right. For you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Ms. Finley. You can thank have you. a seat in the courtroom or thank you're you free to go. Thank you. All right. Your next witness. Plaintiff calls Doug Banya, Your Honor. Okay. Can you spell the last name for me? B A N I A. Thank you. So you can. <coughs> so just a reminder that you're still under oath, okay, sir? Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Banya. Good afternoon. 
Can you briefly reintroduce yourself to the jury, please? Uh, yes. Hi, Doug Bonia. Um, I am from Nevium Intellectual Property Consultants based in San Diego. I um, value intellectual property. I provide litigation support uh, in infringement and defamation cases, as I'm doing today. Uh, and I use um, internet and social media analytics in both of those services. Since you last testified in this case, the jury has heard testimony from Ronald Schnell and Catherine Arnold. Are you familiar with their testimony? Yes. Were you asked to analyze their testimony and provide opinions in response? Yes, I was. Have you formed opinions in response to the testimony of Mr. Schnell and Ms. Arnold? I have. Generally, what are those opinions? Uh, generally, um, you know, Mr. Schnell provided no evidence of uh, a correlation between the Waldman statements and the hashtags and the spikes of those hashtags on Twitter. Uh, second, based on my internet and social media analytics uh, investigation, uh, I've concluded that the uh, alleged comparable actors that uh, Ms. Arnold uh, came up with are not comparable with Ms. Heard. And then thirdly, um, Mr. Schnell uh, and Ms. Arnold uh, both failed to provide any evidence of, of a, a causation as it relates to the Waldman statements uh, causing any economic harm to Ms. Heard. Let's, um, let's dig into those opinions a little bit. Um, you're familiar with the testimony of Mr. Schnell that there are more than 2.7 million alleged negative tweets related to Ms. Heard between January 2018 and June 2021? Yes. And what's your understanding of how Mr. Schnell identified those particular 2.7 million tweets? Yeah, so essentially Mr. Schnell um, chose hashtags that he felt were negative uh, towards Ms. Heard. Uh, those hashtags uh, range from uh, justice for Johnny Depp, um, Amber Heard is an abuser, Amber Turd in the hash uh, tag, we just don't like you, Amber. So then he used those hashtags and he searched through, using the Twitter API, uh, searched through various tweets and then came up with any uh, uh, tweets that were using those hashtags. Did you conduct an analysis of those tweets? Yes, I was given that exact uh, uh, the data that Mr. Schnell used on a hard drive. So yes, I, I, I dug into that data as well. And what was the purpose of your analysis? So what I'm trying to do and what's at issue of the case today, uh, today at this point is, you know, were these tweets, did they contain the Waldman statements? That, that's what we're, where we're at right now, are the Wald, Waldman statements. So I wanted to analyze those tweets to determine uh, which ones and if any uh, contain the Waldman statements. And what's your understanding of what the Waldman statements are? So my understanding is there the three there's three Waldman statements that were published uh, in the Daily Mail. Uh, the Daily Mail is a, a, a UK tabloid, and um, Mr. Um, Arnold um, was quoted in the, in three of those articles. Um, and those dates were on April 8th, 2020, uh, April 27th, 2020, and on June 24th, 2020. And my understanding that those quotes, um, those quotes, I, 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 sorry, I, forget, I think I said the wrong name, but those quotes uh, are the only uh, remaining uh, in this case. Did you analyze the timing of the tweets that we were talking about as compared to the timing of the Waldman statements? And that's exactly what I did. So I wanted to look at the Waldman statements, look at the dates uh, that they happened, and then analyze those as it compared to the Twitter data that I had. Have you prepared a demonstrative that reflects that aspect of your analysis? Yes. Um, your Honor, may I approach? Yes. Did you, did you show counsel?
1293 will just be marked for identification as demonstrative and can be published to the jury. Mr. Vanya, can you explain to the jury what this demonstrative shows? Yes. Um, so this shows um, the total hashtags and tweets uh, that Mr. Schnell was analyzing. Uh, this is the summary data that uh, there are tweets that are running from January 2018 uh, to June of 2021. And again, uh, these are related to the four, four hashtags that I discussed. Um, whenever I get an assignment such as this, when I'm dealing with a, a defamatory statement that's allegedly gone viral online, uh, where there's economic damages involved and there's a lot of data involved, I like to take the data and I like to do a, a 30,000 foot view of the data to see what I'm looking at, to see if there's anything interesting, odd, different about the data. And, and the first thing that I noticed is 35% of the tweets were prior to the Waldman statements. So again, remember my assignment is to determine if the Waldman statements are a part of the, the, the tweets uh, that Mr. Schnell analyzed. So obviously, if uh, these tweets were prior to the Waldman statements, in no way could they have anything to do with the Waldman statements. So th that was the first uh, issue um, that I noticed. Then I noticed uh, what I like to call kind of the alleged defamatory time frame. And as I discussed, that's when the um, uh, Waldman statements were published. That's the date down here. You know, the first one was in the beginning of April, and, and the last one, which is the third one, was at the end of, of June. But what I found interesting is only 2% of all of the tweets happened during this Waldman statement period. So really, these are just observations. And for me, there were red flags that I made note of. And then I just continued with my analysis. Um, what other work have you performed in connection with forming your opinions about the purportedly negative tweets? Yeah, so now I realize that 35% are irrelevant and 2% you know, only happened during this, this important period. I just continued to dig into the 2.79 million um, uh, tweets that Mr. Schnell provided. And Tom, can we take that one down? And Mr. Banya, have you prepared another demonstrative that um, depicts that analysis that you were just describing? Yes. Okay. Your Honor, may I? Okay. Yes. yes. All right. Okay. We'll just see if he has an objection. No, just get, I'll give you time to look at it, sir. All right, plaintiffs. Uh, if you turn on the microphone, I'm sorry. No objection as a demonstrative. Okay. All right, plaintiffs exhibit 1294 will be marked for identification as a demonstrative and will be published to the jury. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Banya, can you explain um, what this demonstrative shows? Yes, this is showing um, the various spikes um, as it relates to the hashtags that Mr. Chanel uh, testified about. This is actually an exhibit or a demonstrative that he used in his testimony. Uh, what this is showing uh, are the large, largest spikes related to the hashtag justice for Johnny Depp. Uh, I don't know if you remember his testimony or, or any of his demonstratives. The other three hashtags did spike at the same time, but a very small spike. So what I'm showing you here are, are, are the six top spikes in Mr. Schnell's analysis. And what's important here again is the very first spike and the largest spike again uh, happened before the Waldman statements. So what I'm trying to figure out is what tweets ha were related to the Waldman statements. So this number one spike, which is the biggest spike, was prior to the Waldman statements. So it's irrelevant to the case. And then the second thing I noticed that was interesting here is here are the dates in gray right here. 
um, this is the time in which the Waldman statements happened. And you're going to notice, as we discussed before, only 2% of the tweets happened during that time. But I found it very interesting for such a viral event that has potentially caused such economic harm, there's no spikes in this area. And actually, you're going to see that Mr. Waldman, you know, uh, his uh, uh, statement came out here in the, in the first April 2020 article. Then the second one came out here. And then the third one came out in June. There's actually a downward use of the spike, uh, downward use of the hashtags. So I'm not seeing any correlation uh, as it relates to uh, the Waldman statements and, and any spikes here as it relates to the hashtags Mr. Chanel chose. Did you analyze each of the spikes that are depicted here? Yeah, so what I did is um, I looked at the six different spikes, and you're going to notice that each spike represents a month. So uh, the second spike, uh, you know, is July of 2020 and so on to the sixth spike going to April 2021. And what I did is, I don't know if you remember my last testimony when I went into Google search and I'm able to go into Google search. I went in and I typed in Amber Heard. And then after you hit search, you can use the tool and you can go back in time. And I chose each six of these dates to go back in time to see what, what was the media talking about back then. You know, what, what was the, the general public being fed as it relates to Amber Heard back during those spikes. And what I found is none of them, well, I actually analyzed the top three search results because they represent 50 to 70 percent of what people click on. And that, well, I realized that none of them had anything to do with the Waldman statements. Are you aware of Mr. Schnell's testimony that the tweets using the four hashtags he looked at were mathematically correlated? Yes. What does that mean? So what Mr. Schnell is saying, uh, which is irrelevant to this case, is the four hashtags that he randomly chose, they, they tend to go up and down together. And that's why he had these spikes here. So the correlation there is how those four hashtags work or dance together going up and down. But first of all, the hashtags have nothing to do with the Waldman statements. And the fact that there's a correlation with, with the hashtags is irrelevant to this case because we're dealing with the Waldman statements, which none of that correlation analysis he did had to do with. How do you know that the correlation doesn't have anything to do with the Waldman statements? Um, can I clear this at all? No. Oh, yeah. Um, well, first of all, I know because that, that would happen right here. You know, if, if, if when Mr. Waldman, one of his quotes was published, you would see a big spike right here. And then you would see maybe a little noise down here. And then the third time you might see a big, second time a big spike, and the third time a big spike. That's not here. So that's telling me there's no correlation between the Waldman statements and, and this hashtag use. And then I've actually provided evidence that there's no correlation because I analyze each of these spikes and none of them had to do with the Waldman statements. Is mathematical correlation the same as causation? No. Why not? I mean, uh, correlation is simply a relationship between uh, two or more variables or two or more things. Uh, in this case, uh, the, the correlation question is, did when, when, when the um, Waldman statements were published, at the same time, did you see a correlation with spikes in these hashtags? And again, you... Can we clear this? You, you see none of that right here. It's actually a downward trend. There's no spikes. There's no correlation. So, you know, again, Mr. Schnell pro provided no evidence of any correlation. What correlation opinion did he provide during his testimony? Well, he provided the correlation that the four hashtags, you know, spike together. But again, those a, the hashtags have nothing to do with the Waldman statements, and the facts that they're correlating or moving together is irrelevant to the case because the case is about the Waldman statements. So what is causation then? 
So causation is where one thing causes a change in the other. So as it relates to this case, did the Waldman statements cause Ms. Heard to have economic harm? In other words, did the Waldman statements cause Ms. Heard not to make as much money in her career? And again, Mr. Schnell provided no evidence of this. Uh, Ms. Arnold provided no evidence of this. And as a matter of fact, during Ms. Arnold's testimony yesterday, she didn't even know what causation was. You know, she was asked, do you know the difference between causation and correlation? And she said that she's not a semantics expert. We're, we're not talking about the words. You know, when it comes to damages, you have to prove causation prior to calculating damages. You know, so there is no causation that's proven here. Uh, therefore, a damages uh, uh, analysis is not appropriate. Did you hear Mr. Schnell testify that he agreed with your opinion in this case? Yes. And what's your understanding of the opinion that he agreed with? Well, he agreed that he failed to link the spikes in the uh, hashtags on Twitter to the Waldman statements. Did he try to do that? He, well, he tried to do that. But Did again, well, again, his analysis was looking at the word Waldman and looking at the word Waldminian and then trying to say that 25% of the tweets included those two terms. But first of all, Waldman isn't the issue here. It's the Waldman statements. And Waldminian, I don't even know what that is, but it's not relevant to this case. We can, I think, take that one down, please, Tom. Mr. Banya, what other work have you done in connection with forming your opinions about Mr. Schnell's testimony? Again, the assignment was to determine if the Waldman statements were part of the, the tweet, so I continued to dig in uh, you know, to the data. Uh, I believe the next step is now that I've excluded you know, the 35% that was before the Waldman statements because they were irrelevant, I wanted to really analyze from the April 2020 forward to see if any of those tweets uh, you know, were contained the Waldman statements. Did you prepare a demonstrative that reflects that analysis that you did? Yes, I did. Okay. Your Honor, may I approach again? All right. Yes, ma'am. Any objection, sir? No objection as a demonstrative. All right. We'll mark it for identification as plaintiff's 1295 as demonstrative and publish to the jury. So, Mr. Banya, did you consider um, the content of the statements made by Waldman as part of the work that you did? Yes. Yeah, so here I reviewed the Waldman statements again. And what I wanted to do uh, is I wanted to determine what, uh, if any, tweets included the Waldman statements. Uh, so what I went, uh, I went back to the Waldman statements and I, I came up with you know, you know, key terms and key themes uh, for, for those Waldman statements, which are listed here. Uh, uh, you know, the Waldman statements were about abuse hoax, sexual violence hoax, and fake sexual violence. So what I did is I, we're now dealing with a 1.2 million tweets because you know, we're starting in April 2020 because that's when the Waldman state, uh, statements uh, started. And what I did is I searched the 1.2 million um, tweets, you know, for these uh, three uh, phrases, and I determined that there were 751 tweets that included those key terms, uh, which is 0.06% of the 1.2 million. And then as I was sifting and sorting and analyzing this data, I, I realized that a lot of these tweets had the exact same language. You know, it was interesting to see it was the exact, exact same tweet because I'm analyzing the language to see if it matches uh, one of these three. I realized that a lot of these tweets were retweet, retweets, likes, uh, or shares. So therefore, I eliminated uh, any of those and it came down uh, with 95 unique tweets. And then what I did from there is I analyzed those to determine if any of these terms were in there 
and I, I identified five tweets that were related to the Waldman statements. Do any of the hashtags Mr. Schnell analyzed include the words from the Waldman statements? No, no, they don't. And, uh, you know, because I am rebutting um, Ms. Arnold, you know, her testimony yesterday, she was saying that the Waldman statements caused these hashtags. Then throughout her, her testimony, she walked that back and admitted, no, none of these tweets have anything to do with the Waldman statements. They don't include the Waldman statements. You know, these hashtags are only hashtags that Schnell, in his opinion, felt that they were negative towards Ms. Hurd. Based on your expertise, what are your overall opinions about Mr. Schnell's testimony and the Twitter hashtag data? You know, Mr. Schnell provided no evidence that any of the tweets uh, were related uh, to the Waldman statements. Um, Mr. Schnell, there's no correlation there. Uh, he also provided no evidence that there's any causation that, you know, uh, the Waldman statements call, caused any economic harm towards Ms. Hurd. Your Honor, I'm about to switch to a different topic. I don't know if you want to break now or push. All right, it's going to be a, a little while, I assume? A, a little bit more, yes. Okay. Yeah. Let's go ahead and break for lunch, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, do not discuss the case and do not do any outside research, okay? All right, we'll come back at 140 then. Is that right? All right, thank, thank you, you. Your Honor. All right.